Section 1. You will hear a woman phoning a box office to ask about a festival in the town of Kenton. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Kenton Festival Box Office. How can I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm coming to Kenton for a few days' holiday next month, and a friend told me there's a festival. She gave me this number to find out about it. That's right. The festival begins on the 16th of May and goes on till the 19th. Oh, that's great. I'll be there from the 15th till the 19th. The festival starts on the 16th of May. So 16th has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Kenton Festival Box Office. How can I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm coming to Kenton for a few days' holiday next month and a friend told me there's a festival. She gave me this number to find out about it. That's right. The festival begins on the 16th of May and goes on till the 19th. Oh, that's great. I'll be there from the 15th till the 19th. So, could you tell me the programme, please? Well, on the first day, there's the opening ceremony in the town centre. People start gathering around 2 o'clock to get a good place to see from and the events will start at 2.45 and finish about 5.30. OK, thanks. I'll make sure I get there early to get a good spot. The festival will be officially opened by the mayor. He'll just speak for a few minutes, welcoming everyone to the festival. All the town councillors will be there, and, of course, lots of other people. Right. Then there'll be a performance by a band. Most years we have a children's choir, but this year the local army cadets offered to perform, and they're very good. Uh huh. After that, a community group from the town will perform a play they've written themselves. Just a short one. It's about Helen Tungate. I don't know if you've heard of her. I certainly have. She was a scientist years ago. That's right. She was born in Kenton exactly 100 years ago, so we're celebrating her centenary. I'm a biologist, so I've always been interested in her. I didn't realise she came from Kenton. Yes. Well, all that will take place in the afternoon, and later, as the sun sets, there'll be a firework display. You should go to the park to watch as you'll get the best view from there. And the display takes place on the opposite side of the river. It's always one of the most popular events in the festival. Sounds great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. 
And what's happening on the other days? There are several events that go on the whole time. For example, the students of the art college have produced a number of videos, all connected with relationships between children and their grandparents. That sounds interesting. It makes a change from children and parents, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. Because the art college is in use for classes throughout the festival, the videos are being shown in Hansworth House. How do you spell the name? H-A-N-D-S-W-O-R-T-H. Hansworth House. It's close to the town hall. Right. Now, let me see, what else can I tell you about? Are there any displays of ballet dancing? I'm particularly interested in that, as I do it as a hobby. There isn't any ballet, I'm afraid, but there'll be a demonstration of traditional dances from all round the country. Well, that would be nice. Where is that being held? It's in the market in the town centre. The outdoor one, not the covered market. And it's on at two and five every afternoon of the festival, apart from the first day. Lovely. I'm interested in all kinds of dancing, so I'm sure I'll enjoy that. Mmm, I'm sure you will. And I'd really like to go to some concerts, if there are any. Yes, there are several. Three performed by professionals and one by local children. And where is it being held? It's in the library which is in Park Street, on the 18th at 6.30 in the evening. I presume I'll need tickets for that. Yes, you can book online or you can buy them when you arrive in Kenton, either at the Festival Box Office or from any shops displaying our logo in the windows. Well, I think that'll keep me busy for the whole of my stay in Kenton. Thank you so much for all your help. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a man talking on the radio about a national arts centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello and welcome to Focus on the Arts. I'm your host, Dave Green, and this is your very own local radio programme. Every Friday evening, we put the spotlight on different arts and culture facilities and look at the shows and events that are on offer in the coming week. And today, the focus is on the National Arts Centre. Now... If you don't already know it yourself, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's famous throughout the world as one of the major venues for classical music. But did you know that it's actually much more than just a place to hear concerts? The centre itself is a huge complex that caters for a great range of arts. Under a single roof it houses concert rooms, theatres, cinemas, art galleries and a wonderful public library, as well as service facilities including three restaurants and a bookshop. So, at any one time, the choice of entertainment there is simply enormous. 
So, how did they manage to build such a big arts complex right in the heart of the city? Well, the area was completely destroyed by bombs during the war in 1940. So the opportunity was taken to create a cultural centre that would be what they called the city's gift to the nation. Of course, it took a while for such a big project to get started, but it was planned in the 60s, built in the 70s, and eventually opened to the public in 1983. Ever since then, it has proved to be a great success. It's not privately owned, like many art centres, but is still in public hands. It's run by the City Council. Both our National Symphony Orchestra and National Theatre Company were involved in the planning of the project, and they're now based there, giving regular performances every week. And as the centre is open 363 days of the year, there are plenty of performances to choose from. Before you hear the rest of the broadcast, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, to give you some idea of what's on, and to help you choose from the many possibilities, we've made a selection of the star attractions. If you're interested in classical music, then we recommend you go along to the National on either Monday or Tuesday evening at 7.30 for a spectacular production of The Magic Flute, probably the most popular of all Mozart's operas. It's in the Garden Hall, and tickets start at only £8, but you'll have to be early if you want to get them that cheap. And remember, it's only on for those two evenings. For those more interested in the cinema, you might like to see the new Canadian film, which is showing on Wednesday evening at 8pm in Cinema 2, and that's called Three Lives. It's had fantastic reviews, and tickets cost just £4.50, which is a reduction on the usual price of £5.50. So, it's really good value, especially for such a great movie. But you can see the centre's main attraction at the weekend, because on Saturday and Sunday, 11am to 10pm, they're showing a wonderful new exhibition that hasn't been seen anywhere else in Europe yet. It's a collection of Chinese art called Faces of China. That's in Gallery 1, and it has some really fascinating paintings and sculptures by leading artists from all over China. And the good news is that it's completely free, so don't miss it. So why not go along to the National Arts Centre next week for one or all of these great events? And you can always pick up a programme and check out all the other performances and exhibitions on offer, or coming soon, on almost every day of the year. Next week, we'll be looking at the new Museum of Science. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a geography student called Caroline discussing her dissertation with her tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Ah, Caroline. Come on in, sit down. Thanks. So how's the dissertation planning going? Well, Dr. Shulman, I'm still having a lot of trouble deciding on a title. Well, that's perfectly normal at this stage. And this is what your tutorials will help you to do. Right. What we'll do is jot down some points that might help you in your decision. 
First of all, you have chosen your general topic area, haven't you? Yes. It's the fishing industry. Oh, yes. That was one of the areas you mentioned. Now, what aspects of the course are you good at? Well, I think I'm coping well with statistics, and I'm never bored by it. Good. Anything else? Well, I found computer modelling fascinating.、Mm -hmm. I have no problem following what's being taught, whereas quite a few of my classmates find it difficult. Well, that's very good. Do you think these might be areas you could bring into your dissertation? Oh, yes, if possible. It's just that I'm having difficulty thinking how I can do that. You see, I feel I don't have sufficient background information. I see. Well, do you take notes? <sighs> I'm very weak at note taking.、Mm -hmm. My teachers always used to say that. Well, I think you really need to work on these weaknesses before you go any further. What do you suggest? Before you hear the rest of the tutorial, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen. And answer questions twenty four to thirty. Well, I can go through the possible strategies with you and let you decide where to go from there. Okay, thanks. Well, some people find it helpful to organize peer group discussions. You know, each week a different person studies a different topic and shares it with the group. Oh. Oh, right. It really helps build confidence. Yeah. You know, having to present something to others. I can see that. The drawback is that everyone in the group seems to share the same ideas. They keep being repeated in all the dissertations. Okay. You could also try a service called Student Support.、Mm -hmm. It's designed to give you a structured program over a number of weeks to develop your skills. Sounds good. Yes, unfortunately, there are only a few places. Ah, but it's worth looking into. Yes, of course. I know I've got to work on my study skills. And then there are several study skills books you can consult. Right. They'll be a good source of reference. But the problem is, they are sometimes too general. Yes, that's what I've found. Other than that,、uh, I would strongly advise quite simple ideas. Uh, like using a card index. Well, yes, I've never done that before.、Uh, it's simple, but it really works because you have to get points down in a small space.、Hmm. Another thing I always advise is don't just take your notes and forget about them. Read everything three times. That'll really fix them in your mind. Yes, I can see it would take discipline, but well. If you establish good study skills at this stage, they'll be with you all your life. Oh yes, I completely agree.、Mm. It's just that I don't seem to be able to discipline myself. I need to talk things over.、Mm, well,、uh, we'll be continuing these tutorials, of course.、Uh, let's arrange next month's now. Let's see.、Um, I can see you virtually any time during the week starting、uh, the twenty-second of January. Um, what about the twenty fourth? I'm、mm. free in the afternoon.、Uh, sorry, I'm booked then.、Mm. Uh, what about the following day?、Uh, the Thursday.、Yeah. I can make the morning. Fine, we'll go for the twenty fifth then. That's great. Thanks. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture to business students about the use of one particular type of research known as ethnography. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called ethnography. This is a type of research aimed at exploring the way human cultures work. It was first developed for use in anthropology, and it's also been used in sociology and communication studies. So, what's it got to do with business, you may ask? Well, businesses are finding that ethnography can offer them deeper insight into the possible needs of customers, either present or future, as well as providing valuable information about their attitudes towards existing products. And ethnography can also help companies to design new products or services that customers really want. Let's look at some examples of how ethnographic research works in business. One team of researchers did a project for a company manufacturing kitchen equipment. They watched how cooks used measuring cups to measure out things like sugar and flour. They saw that the cooks had to check and recheck the contents because although the measuring cups had numbers inside them, the cooks couldn't see these easily. So, a new design of cup was developed to overcome this problem, and it was a top seller. Another team of ethnographic researchers looked at how cell phones were used in Uganda, in Africa. They found that people who didn't have their own phones could pay to use the phones of local entrepreneurs. Because these customers paid in advance for their calls, they were eager to know how much time they'd spent on the call so far. So, the phone company designed phones for use globally with this added feature. Ethnographic research has also been carried out in computer companies. In one company, IT systems administrators were observed for several weeks. It was found that a large amount of their work involved communicating with colleagues in order to solve problems, but that they didn't have a standard way of exchanging information from spreadsheets and so on. So, the team came up with an idea for software that would help them to do this. In another piece of research, a team observed and talked to nurses working in hospitals. This led to the recognition that the nurses needed to access the computer records of their patients no matter where they were. This led to the development of a portable computer tablet that allowed the nurses to check records in locations throughout the hospital. Occasionally, research can be done even in environments where the researchers can't be present. For example, in one project done for an airline, respondents used their smartphones to record information during airline trips, in a study aiming at tracking the emotions of passengers during a flight. So, what makes studies like these different from ordinary research? Let's look at some of the general principles behind ethnographic research in business. First of all, the researcher has to be completely open-minded. He or she hasn't thought up a hypothesis to be tested, as is the case in other types of research. Instead, they wait for the participants in the research to inform them. As far as choosing the participants themselves is concerned, that's not really all that different from ordinary research. The criteria according to which the participants are chosen may be something as simple as the age bracket they fall into, or the researchers may select them according to their income, or they might try to find a set of people who all use a particular product, for example. But it's absolutely crucial to recruit the right people as participants. As well as the criteria I've mentioned, they have to be comfortable talking about themselves and being watched as they go about their activities. Actually, most researchers say that people open up pretty easily, maybe because they're often in their own home or workplace. So, what makes this type of research special is that it's not just a matter of sending a questionnaire to the participants. Instead, the research is usually based on first-hand observation of what they are doing at the time. But that doesn't mean that the researcher never talks to the participants. However, 
unlike in traditional research, in this case, it's the participant rather than the researchers who decides what direction the interview will follow. This means that there's less likelihood of the researcher imposing his or her own ideas on the participant. But after they've said goodbye to their participants and got back to their office, the researcher's work isn't finished. Most researchers estimate that 70 to 80% of their time is spent not on the collecting of data, but on its analysis, looking at photos, listening to recordings and transcribing them, and so on. The researchers may end up with hundreds of pages of notes. And to determine what's significant, they don't focus on the sensational things or the unusual things. Instead, they try to identify a pattern of some sort in all this data and to discern the meaning behind it. This can result in some compelling insights that can, in turn, feed back to the whole design process. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Please stop writing and wait for your question booklet to be collected.